Hello, my name is Del Stevens. Some of you know me as the Tuna Dog. This is the second seminar in a series, and today we're going to talk about advanced techniques on how to find and catch albacore tuna off the Pacific Northwest. We're going to talk about how to convert the bite uh, from a troll caught fish to a wide open bite, or how to switch to maybe fish and iron. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about electronics, and a little bit about techniques, and a little bit about gear. Our first seminar in the when I talked about tuna basics, we talked about how to find fish. And I emphasize food is the key to it. I want you to remember that. I'm going to talk about that in every seminar I talk about. So that way we drive that point home. Food is number one. Temperature is number two. And you should subscribe to a online web-based sea surface temperature and chlorophyll website uh, if you have the ability to. It's not very expensive. It's like $99 a year. If you need to, get one of your buddies that's a partner on the boat to pay for it as their contribution to your fishing. So one of the things that we're looking at when, when we're looking at these web-based sites is temperature and where we're going to go for the next day and we're looking at chlorophyll. But let me take that a little bit further. Over the years I've learned that albacore tuna, they do in fact like 58 to 62 degree water. But I have found them in colder water, and you'll also find them in warmer water. But you need to understand how to fish them under different conditions. This chart is from August 24, 2009. It's off the Columbia River. There's the mouth of the Columbia River. Here's the Astoria Canyon. And you'll notice that here is a temperature grid on the side. And right in here, we've got 59, switching to 60 degrees in this green water. Great transition area from cold to warm water. And this area right here happens to be very fishy. I've caught a lot of fish over the years in that spot. And, but one of the things that this temperature chart shows me is look how warm this water is. It's clear up in the 64, 65, 66 degrees. If I wind up getting out into this water, this chart by itself tells me how I'm going to have to fish. The water is warm. The tuna are going to be down in the thermocline. If you think you're going to troll and find fish, it's going to be a long, slow day, and you're not going to catch very many fish. So you're forced with a different program. Same with the chlorophyll. It'll show you where the breaks are, but now with temperature being warm, this defines how I'm going to fish. So if I was going to run offshore and fish it here, I know that my tuna are down deep, and I'm going to have to be able to go down and get them. I know that I'm going to have to work the iron. So if I don't know how to work the iron, it's going to be a rough day. Okay. One of the things you want to look at doing is you should be, you should focus on getting really, really, really good at finding fish. And I use a number of things for that. This is just a web-based sea surface temperature through Terrafin. Um, I also have Sirius XM weather on my boat and Sirius XM fish mapping. The Sirius XM weather provides sea surface temperatures and a grid over here, plus it pl provides longitude and latitude. If I put my finger on the chart on a touch screen or move the cursor uh, out to it, and then it'll tell you how far it is. Okay. Same thing here, this is more serious XM weather. It provides swell period. Gives me uh, an idea of if I'm running out, maybe which way do I want to look for fish if the swells and the winds are coming from a certain direction. Obviously it's a lot smoother uh, running one direction than it is another. So sometimes that helps you with planning. But take that into consideration as well. Another thing that you should do is take your electronics and switch them, once you get out into the fishing grounds, switch them to manual and take them off auto. They're looking all the way. You're in a couple thousand feet of water. They're looking for the bottom. They're looking for everything in between. And consequently, the signal's going to be weaker. If you only look 100 or 200 feet, your signal's going to be much stronger. You'll get a better picture. In this one here, this is a picture from quite a few years ago. I'm only looking 70 feet. Uh, I actually was in a wide open bite at the time and took this picture right at the end, right before we stopped fishing and there was a lot of fish under the boat. This actually is low chirp. My temperature sensor had broke that day 
and um, got it fixed, but uh, switch it to off auto, on a manual, and then um, you'll have a better picture. But um, there's no sense in looking any deeper than what you can actually fish. You can't fish 2,000 feet anyway. So the other thing I would do is, is I have since learned that high chirp and high frequency um, will, will provide you a better picture. So when you're fishing shallow like this, you're better off being on a, on a uh, high frequency. Um, standard sonar versus chirp sonar, basically a short version of that is high definition television versus low definition. A um, lot more signal going through the water at one time, comes back, gets compressed into one picture, provides a much greater picture. Most everything anymore is chirp sonar. So you have low chirp, medium chirp, and high chirp, ranging anywhere from about 40 kilohertz up to about 240 to 260 kilohertz. This is pan optics, Garmin pan optics. And I do have this on my boat for tuna, and this is actually a, uh, a diagram. The boat's sitting here, and my transducer's looking out 15 feet, and this is a jig coming down. When it's, there it is, coming down. A fish comes in and takes it, and it is that live. You can actually see, when I drop a jig down, you can see the jig go down, and you can see the tuna react to it. So on days when I need to find tuna, and I know that I can't troll for them because the water temperature is warm, I'll run out to a spot where I think there's probably tuna, based on everything I've seen. I'll stop. I'll have wet ear Megan lower, drop the iron, work it a little bit. One of them will work one type of iron, one of them will work another type of iron, and we'll see if we get a reaction down there. One, we're either going to hook up, or two, we're going to see the reaction on the screen, and we'll see if there's tuna there. And if there's tuna there, then we'll work it for a while trying to get them going. But this is what I have used for many of the last four or five years, and where I've only trolled maybe three or four times in the last five years. And this is what enables me to fine tuna. A little bit different picture of it. This is actually two different screens here. This screen, is, you can see it looking down. This screen, you can see it looking forward. There's the boat looking back a little bit. Here's a fish coming along here. You can see the jig come down. He jigs it a couple of times. That fish is turning on it right now. Jigs it again. And that fish is going to take it right about now. That's how live pan optics is, okay? So the boat's sitting here, it's looking forward or looking in a direction, however way you have that transducer pointed, out 50 feet, and it's looking down about 40 feet, okay? So different perspective up here, this is looking straight down, this is looking forward. So two different screens on this screen. Today's topic being advanced techniques, I'm gonna talk briefly about outriggers. Do you need outriggers to catch albacore? No. Outriggers do provide you the opportunity to spread your lures out and put a bigger spread out. Cover a little bit more water, and, um, but anymore I hardly ever use my outriggers for other than anything other than flying a flag on them. Once in a while. But uh, you've got aluminum outriggers that have eyelets on them, allows you to run multiple lines off them with release clips. And you have fiberglass. Typically the fiberglass ones will have a cord that runs up through the middle of them, comes out the end of them. Typically you can only run one line off that rigger. <clears throat> we call this the long rigger, short rigger, shotgun rig, and flat line. And the flat line comes into play because we're fishing really short behind the boat. And by fishing short, if you have a six foot rod, and you're only fishing 25, 30 feet behind the boat, you've got a pretty good angle on the lure down there and it could actually be skipping out of the water a little bit. What you wanna do is you wanna put a release clip on this thing. And what I do is I hook this on a cleat at the back of the boat and I reach up and I pull my line down and I put it in this release clip down below and it flattens my line coming through the water and allows that lure to actually fish better. And uh, we call that a flat line clip. Hence the flat line. So you have a lot of choices for outrigger clips. The knockouts are probably my, they are my favorite. They're one of the best. 
This has adjustments on each end, roller bearings in here, and that is a roller so the line will go through it. If you're fishing with braid and you're fishing with something uh, like one of the AFCO roller trawlers that sometimes um, you get the adjustment wrong on, they'll st stay stuck and fish is peeling line off. Last thing you want to do is reach up and get your hand cut on that braid that is screaming off that reel at Mach 3. The knockouts have worked better for me. They're expensive. They're $50 a set, but they last a long time. Put a little WD-40 on them every year. They'll last a long time. The release clips like these work really well. There's an adjustment up here on the side. Easy to use. Some people will take the Z-clips like this and mount them on the back of their boat up somewhere around right below the gunnel on the back of the boat. And um, I prefer to not mount them on mine. I use a clip I can take off and put back on during the day. So it works really well for outriggers. We talked about how do you want to fish. And one of the things you need to decide is do you want to troll for the day? Do you want to learn to work iron? Do you want to fish swim baits? How are you going to fish today? Well, one of the things that some of the people that fish with me like to do is they like to learn how to convert a troll caught fish into a wide open bite. So we're going to talk about that for a few minutes. First thing is don't keep trolling to load up the rods. When you're trolling for tuna, and that's what you're going to do all day, you want to keep trolling seven to ten seconds to try to load your rods up and get as many fish hooked up as you can and then cut the power and reel your fish in, reel your empty rods in if they're going to get tangled up. <clears throat> if you're wanting to convert a troll caught fish to a wide open bite, the first thing you need, when the first rod goes off, you need to stop immediately. I, I pull the throttle back into neutral and I pull the throttle back into reverse to stop my slide. The boat's still sliding forward. I want to stop it. I want to stay with that fish. So don't keep trolling to load the rods up. Convert. Transition time is critical. You got to work as a team. Uh, one of my buddies calls it the magic minute that you have to convert that. And I say it's got to be a lot quicker than that. You got to get it done in about 30 seconds. So what happens is, is when we leave the dock in the morning, if you're fishing with me and I have three or four other people, I'm giving everybody an assignment. Your job might be working iron. Your job might be working iron. Your job might be to pitch a swim bait. Your job might be to chum. Your job might be to have a live bait rod ready. Okay? So that way when we hear that singing of the reel, zzz, the line goes, the fish hits the line, it's peeling off the reel, everybody know, go, jumps into action knows what to do. Okay? Everybody's got a job. So what happens on a wide open, on trying to get that to a wide open bite, a typical scenario, my wife, her job is to chum. Megan's job is to drop iron. So I might have one or two other people with a swim bait rod that's somewhere close to the back of the boat, zzz, the rod goes off. I want them to pitch that swim bait rod directly at that fish. Not out to the side, directly at that fish. You're not going to get tangled up, don't worry about it. Pitch that rod towards that fish, bail open, let her free spool. You'll feel the fish when he picks it up. It'll feel, you'll just feel, it'll feel like a trout bite. Flip the bail back over, you're hooked up. If you don't hook up after 30 seconds, flip the bail over, stick it in a rod holder, leave it grab maybe the rod that has the fish on it. If I have two people doing that, both of them are going to flip their bales over, put it in the rod holder, and now they're going to grab maybe iron rods or live bait rods. And Wetty chummed with live bait, and what she did was she took the live bait net, a scoop of bait, and she smacked the back of it out towards the side and towards the, where that fish, towards the back of the boat. By smacking the back of this net, you're stunning those fish, those bait fish. It gives the tuna a chance to get on them before they come to and, and they're back swimming again. So now you've got stunned bait fish in there. She's getting another scoop and she's putting bait on hooks for live bait rods. This is all happening fairly fast. Okay. Get the live bait rods over, but you, you gotta, the boat's got to be stopped. 
The reason I put the boat into reverse is to stop that drift of that boat in any direction. It has to be stationary. And by now, I've got my screen on my sonar where I'm looking, and I've got my pan optics on. And even if you don't have pan optics, if you're set at 0 to 100, 0 to 150 feet, you're probably going to see the fish anyway. And that'll tell you how far to drop iron. So now we've pitched swim baits to the back. We've got live bait rods ready to go. We've done some chumming, maybe a couple of scoops of bait slapped and over to the side of the boat. And now the boat's stationary and they're able to drop iron down into the zone where the fish are at. And I'm looking at the sonar and telling him how far to drop that iron. Okay. We use this technique many, many times. If you don't get them going wide open, work it. 10, 15, 20 minutes. A big part of catching albacore is finding them. And now you've found them because you hooked up. So don't just, well, we didn't get them hooked up, so we're just going to move on. I had a group of guys fishing with me, a father and two adult sons one time. And when we left the dock, I asked them, how many fish do you guys want today? And they are like six apiece. 18 fish. We'd been catching fish pretty good. And it's like 18 fish. That's not going to take us very long. We'll be back to the dock fairly quick. And my wife, Wetty, was with me and uh, helping me as my deckhand that day. We ran offshore, found a kelp paddy, threw a swim bait to it, hooked up a tuna, landed that one. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. We're going to get this going. And nothing. So then we went on the troll. We trolled. We hooked a fish. They went into that routine pitching swim baits back and dropping iron and nothing. By noon, we had 10 fish in the box. It's like, man, we are struggling. But every time, we'd go into that routine to try to catch fish. And uh, I'm thinking, oh, man, okay, our day is just going to take a while to get to 18 fish. Well, at noon, it clicked and went wide open. Sometimes you have to just practice it and practice it and practice it. But don't give up on it. That's how you get good at it is keep practicing it. And today when we run offshore and do that, most of the time I can teach beginners how to do it and they're on it. And a lot of times we'll get the bike going right away. So, so don't be impatient to go back on the troll. One of the things that happens, like I said, finding fish is a big part of catching fish. We had an opportunity one time we were offshore, we'd had a bite going, had about 20 fish on the deck, we lost our bite. I was on a buddy's boat, he's firing up the engines, we're getting ready to move. I said, well, where are you going to go? Because there was fish jumping in every direction that you looked around the boat. For as far as you could see, there was fish jumping. There was no, we didn't have any sharks yet. So I said, where are you going to go? So we killed the engines, we took a break. There's nothing wrong with taking a break. We put one rod overboard with a live bait on it, put the clicker on, and they'll let you know when they're back. And within 15 minutes after taking a break, we were going again. Put another 20 plus fish on the deck in that stop before the sharks actually showed up. You don't want to rinse the boat out, don't want to rinse the blood out. If you rinse the blood out, the sharks are going to show up right away. So you're going to have to live in that blood. So it's, you're better off wearing rubber boots and rubber, rain, rubber bibs if you have them to fish in, in conditions like that. But don't leave. Stay there, keep fishing, take a break once in a while in between the bites, and you'll be fine. We talked about live bait is the most common chumming. Uh, the chopped up herring, squid, and dead bait being your most common as well. Remember to salt your dead bait so it'll sink. If you don't salt, it'll be tough. You can also hook a dead bait on as a live, if you don't have live bait, you can use a dead bait. They work almost as well some days. <clears throat> what if they're jumping but they don't bite? Well, what's your water temperature? Think about it. Be methodical about it. If they're jumping out there but they're not biting, a lot of times you control swim baits way back. You're not going to have a huge day unless you can hook up on one and get the bite wide open but most of the time you're trolling your swim baits a lot farther away from the boat 
So it's even more critical that you get the boat stopped and stay with that fish. So opportunities like that, if you see a jumper, I typically run to where the jumper's at and I typically stop right there, start dropping iron, and I start chumming at the same time. A lot of times the chumming will slowly bring them up, but if you hook them on iron, a lot of times you'll bring the school up with the iron. And if you're chumming, your people up on, maybe if you have people that are live bait fishing, now it gives them an opportunity to catch fish as well. All right, so let's recap. Converting a troll caught fish is one method of finding fish and getting them wide open. So you're hooked up, stop immediately versus continuing to troll. You want to stop immediately on that first fish. Don't try to load your rods up and then try to convert that. You might get it done in July when they're not quite as spooky and they're biting easier, uh, but you're probably not going to get that done at all in August or September. So stop immediately, develop a technique, assign everybody a job to do, and practice it. And practice it. So there's one method of finding and converting fish. The other method that I've talked about is a little bit using your electronics, finding where you want to go, start fishing, get to that spot, maybe not troll, just get to that spot, change your sonar, zero to 70, zero to 100 feet, whatever depth you're comfortable fishing at, throw some chum, drop some iron, see if you can get them to go. You don't have to have pan optics, it helps, but you don't have to have pan optics to catch fish. Like we talked about before in the earlier seminar, the ocean is very much like a lake and a river in that it has contours, seamounds, canyons, things where there's currents and upwellings that trap and hold bait fish. So consequently, there are areas in the ocean that consistently produce fish. If you didn't have anything to go on, if it was cloudy and you didn't have a temperature shot on your web-based service, or didn't have the um, Sirius XM weather, and you just ran to a spot that consistently produced fish, you still have a pretty good shot of catching fish. And you could just pull the throttles back right there, stop right there, and start fishing, and you could get them going. I've had a few times where I've done just that, went to a spot where I thought there was fish, pulled the throttles back, start fishing, never left there. Like I said, I've used my electronics and my pan optics to find fish, for, through most of the last five, six years, there's only been a handful of times I've had to troll. And most of those times when we ran to that spot, pulled the throttles back, start fishing, we got them going about 70% of the time. The times we didn't, I'd leapfrog about a mile at a time and try it all over again, or another mile and try it all over again. Most of the time we haven't had to move very much. Those areas consistently hold fish and it's a good place to try that. So when you're hooked up on the troll, somebody has to roll the troll gear in and clear it. I typically am the guy running the boat and I'm typically the deckhand doing that. So somebody also has to do that. While everybody's pitching swim baits and dropping iron and live bait, I'm clearing the deck. I'm leaving that fish for last that's hooked up and I'll give him last unless he's going to get tangled up for some reason. Maybe we're drifting. If I have outriggers out and you've got lines out and you're drifting pretty good, you need to bring your outriggers in. You need to bring the lines on the outriggers in, otherwise they are going to get tangled up. So that's the one thing you've got to be careful about is on days when you've got quite a bit of drift, the boat may turn and you may get tangled up if you don't clear the lines fairly quickly. So, so let's talk about rig and swim baits. I've got a, jig, a two ounce jig head that's got a painted head with eyes on it. And I've got a one ounce unpainted with eyes on it. You don't have to have a painted jig head to catch albacore, but it should have eyes on it, okay? And then most of the time I'm fishing a walleye whacker, which is kind of pink got a little bit of a black back to it, a little bit of pearl belly, and this is a five inch swim bait. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay my jig head 
right beside it. So I can see where the bend in the hook matches up with the back of the swim bait. And then I'm going to take and I'm going to mark it across the back like this. And I'm going to thread my swim bait into it and work it down there. So that way it comes out even. If you mark the back, you won't have to put any glue on this up here and it'll come out and it'll match up perfectly to it. And it won't slide back if you're trolling it. If you don't mark it properly, yes, you may get a gap back here when you're trolling it. So you want to make sure you mark the back of it and then come out evenly on, on the back of it. Otherwise it's not going to troll properly. If you're pitching swim baits, it's not as critical to come out in the center. So, and that's how you, you thread that swim bait on there. And then you tie your fluorocarbon directly to the head. You don't put a swivel here. It's like when it's tied and you're getting ready to fish it. You only need three or four feet of fluorocarbon on this rod. And this is a seven foot six rod. You should have something that you're comfortable that'll cast quite a ways something seven and a half, eight, some guys even fish a nine and a 10 foot rod with a nice spin rail on the bottom of it. This is actually a Daiwa Proteus wind rod with a Daiwa Saltiga reel on it. It's got about 300 yards of 30 pound braid with a fluorocarbon top shot tied directly to it and it'll run out the guides pretty good. Okay, so we've talked about trolling swim baits We've talked about how to convert the bite to a wide open bite. One of the things that I do is I also, when I'm fishing live bait or I'm dead in the water, is I'm fishing iron. And if you're gonna be fishing tuna in the Northwest on a regular basis, this is something you're gonna have to put in your arsenal. You're, at some point, you're gonna have to learn how to fish this. Otherwise, you're gonna have days when the tuna are down in the thermocline and you have no way to get down there to get them without learning how to do that. So. I am going to give a whole seminar on working the iron, so I'm just going to touch briefly on this today. And um, with jigging, it's changed a lot. We have high speed jigging that we used to do. We, that has changed a little bit to slow pitch jigging, which is much easier and is a technique more than anything. But it does require the right rod and reels to do it. High pitch jigging, a little bit different. And then casting iron much like we would pitching swim baits to jumpers, you can pitch iron to jumpers as well. Some guys really like it. It's heavier, it'll fly farther sometimes. High speed jigging, that's what we've had for the most part the last few years. Basically you're dropping a lure into the strike zone, working the rod and reel real fast frantically and bringing it back. Fast erratic action has been the key to entice a strike, but that can wear you out, that can be really tiring all day. So it takes a parabolic jig rod and a high speed reel. Slow pitch jigging, this is the newest thing. Uh, it's been out for a couple years now and more and more people are going to it. The jig shape is different and the action is different, totally different. You can do it all day without any problem. The, the biggest difference between slow pitch and regular jigging is how your lure behaves. Slow pitch jigs. They typically are shaped like this, oval, wide in the center. They'll have hooks on both ends of them. And here's some of the manufacturers of those, the most common ones out there. And it seems like every day there's another jig manufacturer out there. There's a lot of people making jigs right now, slow pitch jigs. So, like I said, I'll cover this in a lot more detail in my Work in the Iron seminar. If you're going to make your own assist hooks, I'll cover that as well. I fish the Gamagatsu 510 in the two watt size, and I'll show you how to make your own. If you get the opportunity to fish live bait, it's a lot of fun. And the action can be fast and furious. The most common bait we have is anchovies. They're small, they're only about three inches long, and you're gonna fish a hook that's probably a one or a two in size, It'll have a ringed live bait hook, a ring on it, which causes that bait to be free. And um, you're going to tie it to 
for the most part, 30 pound fluorocarbon. As fluorocarbon goes, I fish Seaguar fluorocarbon. Seaguar Premier is stiff and won't move an awful lot. I use it on some of my lures. Seaguar Blue Label is really soft, flexible, and is much softer, much easier to fish. And a lot of people like that. P-Line is probably, um, probably the next best. Seaguar is the inventor of fluorocarbon. So 30 pound for the most part will cover it for most people. Some people drop down to 25 pound or even lighter if they get spooky. I try to chum them more and get them going hotter and faster so that way I don't have to fiddle around with having different amounts of fluorocarbon. If you have about an 8 to 10 foot top shot of fluorocarbon tied directly to your braid, that works really well. Some guys will put a swivel right there so they can pre-make top shots in case they're going through a lot of them. So there's about nine different methods to hook a live bait. Most people hook them through the nose or the dorsal. Hook them through the nose right here. Don't hook them vertically because it'll pin their mouth shut. They won't get enough water coming across their gills and they'll suffocate and die. So they'll either hook them this way or they'll hook them up here or hook them up here. We used to say if you wanted them to dive, hook them back here in the anus and a little bit of pressure on the, on the line will cause, hold their butt up in the air and their head down and cause them to swim down. It's easier just to put a small, like a 3 8 ounce sinker on the line, three or four feet up. You want to slowly take them down. You don't want to drag them down real fast. They're, they're real, um, anchovies die real easy. You don't want to be very rough with them or they're not going to fish very good. And for the most part, when you're scooping bait out of the live well, you're trying to get the fastest, most aggressive anchovy you can. That's the guy you want to fish. Casting or fly lining the bait. You don't want to whip the bait out there, pull a little bit of line off, and just lob it out and let the line go as you lob it. We call that fly lining the bait. Very, very gentle with it. I use a seven foot six Proteus rod from Daiwa for my live bait rod. It has a very soft tip and a Saltiga size 20 lever drag reel. You want a lever drag reel because you want the bail open and you want to feed that line out there, have the bail open with a clicker on, and as the tuna comes and takes it, picks it up, you want count to about three to five seconds before you slowly run the lever drag up and load the rod up. If you have a, a reel that has a bail on it and where you just flip it, you're going to snap that thing off a number of times. That's where a lever drag reel comes in really nice. So you don't have to have a lot of line. Most of the time uh, when you're live bait fishing, it doesn't they don't make big runs. It's rare that they make a big run. In the fall, you get a 35 pound fish, 36, 37 pounder, I mean a big guy. He might make a few longer runs, but for the most part, if you had 250, line, 250 yards of line on a reel, you're going to be fine. I fish 50 pound braid on my live bait reels and 30 pound fluorocarbon top shots. The live well is critical. If you're going to get into live bait fishing, you really need to check your live well out before you start this. Most live wells mounted in most boats is not adequate. You'll, you'll be lucky if the bait will survive all day. The last few years, some of the boat builders on the East Coast have done a lot better job. They make pressurized live wells. They um, put sea chests in the bottom down in the bilge area. And a sea chest is basically a box that's below the water line that allows water in. And inside this box are bilge pumps that pump to your live well pump. That way you have a constant flow of water and you don't get air in there if you're backing up or something happens or something plugs it up. Many times they're where the water comes in and they'll have a way to unsnap them so you can get in and clean them out. Uh, they have a valve on them so you can shut them off so that way the water doesn't flow in while you're trying to do all that and, and the boat starts sinking. But a uh, sea chest uh, helps with that. But um, you can make a sea chest most of them are made out of uh, stainless steel and have a clear plastic top to them. But pretty easy to make. 
your live well should fill in eight minutes. And you should regulate your live well by your outflow. That's the best way to regulate it. Kodiak live wells are one of the best live wells out there. There's a number of good ones. I have a 50 gallon Kodiak. I can put seven scoops of bait in that thing. They'll last all day and be doing great. Just because the flow comes in at all different levels all up and down that live well and the flow goes out at all different levels up and down that live well. So when you look inside my live well, my bait is fish swimming in a circle, in an oval. And you can see the flow coming in at all different levels and the flow going out at all different levels. That's how a live well should properly function. If a live well comes in from one little spigot of, it, of water coming in and shoots down, there's nowhere for the fish, the bait, to get in line and have the flow coming to them or swim against it and get oxygen. They're going to struggle. They're all going to congregate around that one spot where the water's coming in. So if it comes in too slow, they're going to die. They're not going to get enough oxygen. If it comes in in about nine minutes, you're probably okay. If it comes in too fast, they're going to swim way too hard and they're going to die. If there's corners in the live well, they're going to congregate in the corners. They're going to die. If the live well is too wide and too narrow, you can't get enough oval flow. You're better off putting a divider in there or creating, making it smaller. You should have a light in there or a clear lid so they can get light in there. And then paint the live well a light blue like on my screen here. It's real soothing to them, kind of calms them down. And then don't spend $150 on four or five scoops of bait and run offshore really hard on a rough ocean trying to get out there now and kill your bait. That doesn't do you any good to get out there and half your bait's dead already from running too hard. And when you're out there fishing, if you see a boat dead in the water, don't approach it. Leave that boat alone. You know, don't, get, don't troll near it and don't get over by them unless they invite you in. I would maintain a couple hundred yards distance between any boat. And if you see a boat out there dead in the water, we've talked about how to find tuna. That should be an indication right there there's tuna in the area. You could forget trolling, just get upwind of them in their chum trail and kill the power and start live bait fishing. There's probably going to be fish within a couple hundred yards of them. You just get in their drift and start fishing with them. You don't have to troll around all day. You want to bleed these fish really well. After fighting them for quite a while, their body temperature can jump 80, up to 85 degrees. And one of the things that I do after I cut them and I bleed them down in a bleed bucket, this bleed bucket has no holes in it so it won't leak out. I don't want blood coming out of this bleed bucket. Okay? I'm going to dump it when I get done fishing. But I want to contain all the blood because I don't want blood going into the water. Sharks are going to show up at some point just from the blood coming off the tuna I'm trying to slow that down as much as possible don't bring back more than you can care for think about how many fish you want to catch today I always ask the people I'm fishing with how many do you want how many do you want how many do you want and that's where we try to stop and some days you get to bite going so fast and so furious that it's hard to stop so bleed your fish cut them in the pectoral fan behind in the pectoral area or in the gills Brain spike them to prevent them from shaking if you want. And one of the things that I do is when I gaff my fish, I bring them overboard and try to gaff them in the head. Bring them overboard and while I, I keep them on the gaff. I go to the bleed bucket, I unhook them, and while I have them on the gaff, I cut them. And now I reach down, take the tail, and I lift them off of there, head first down into the bleed bucket. Don't gaff them, flop them out on the floor, and now you have to chase them. You wind up trying to, one, you're spending time instead of fishing, trying to catch the darn fish again, and two, that fish flop around there has a hook in him, and if that's any, a treble hook or a big hook, you could get yourself hooked. I've had it happen, okay? Should you net the fish versus gaff them? Some people say it's less messy, no, it's not. I have buddies that have told me, oh, my boat's less messy. I've seen pictures of their boat. Their boat looks like my boat. It's all bloody. If you want to net them, 
it might be more gentle on the fish versus gaffing them and missing them every now and then and maybe gaffing them in the, in the, the loin or something. But um, it's just a preference what you want to do. Some guys use a slurry bucket. Do not bleed your fish in a slurry bucket. If you've got a bloody nose and you put ice on your nose, it slows the bleeding down. Bleed them out in a regular bucket and then put them on a slurry to chill them down. Okay, get them bled out really good. And for a slurry, I take a big handful of salt for about 30 to 40 pounds of ice, for every 30 to 40 pounds of ice, and then I'll add some bucket, five gallon buckets of seawater to it to create my slurry. And by the time you get back to the dock at the end of the day, that slurry will be so cold you won't be able to put your hand in it. And if you want to leave your fish in there overnight, if you're beat and tired and, and have had enough for one day, leave them overnight. They cark much easier the next day and easier to handle. And you'll have to break the ice to get into them in the fish box. So, Fish kill bags versus coolers. They're both good. Fish kill bags are more flexible in how you move them around where you put them in the boat. If you've got a cooler, just make sure it doesn't have wheels on it. If it does, make sure you tie it to the boat pretty good. You don't want weight shifting in the boat on your way back in and posing a problem capsizing the boat. Gutting the tuna, I don't gut the tuna. When I get back in, they're on ice, we cark them and that's it. And there's four loins to a tuna. So the back, back loins are the really nice choice loins. The belly loins are what we use for canning most of the time. They work best for that. You should develop a when to go or not to go attitude for running offshore. Develop an attitude that you are the captain. This is my boat. I'm not going to let my people talk me into going. If I'm uncomfortable running in a rough sea, you're going to have an uncomfortable day fishing. So you need to make sure that you, you learn that. Know your boat's fuel range. Run with a buddy. Have a chart of the area. Get an EPIRB. So that way if you have an emergency offshore, your cell phone's not an emergency device. An EPIRB is. So is a VHF radio with a DSC button. And make sure you get a handheld VHF as a backup, one that floats and one that has a GPS built into it. Life rafts, what's your, what's your, what's your life worth? You're 50 miles offshore and nobody can run out there and rescue you right away. The Coast Guard is going to send a helicopter first. It'll take 40 minutes to get there on the average even longer for their, their motor lifeboats to get there. Other boats out there are going to be quicker getting to you in a mayday call. So think about that. And most of the time you'd have time to deploy a life raft if you had a problem. So get yourself a ditch bag or a ditch kit and put your flares in it, put your backup stuff in it, things listed here. Have a handheld GPS. The handheld VHF uh, is probably number one. I carry a handheld VHF all the time. So, all right. That's it for this seminar. Be sure you catch the next seminar. We have two more seminars. We've got one seminar on working the iron in depth on how to do it, the technique, the rods, the reels, the gear, the lures, and another advanced seminar on finding fish and different techniques. All right, thank you.